as I said, there are two kinds of disagreement, legitimate on the one hand, and fabricated, fake, uh, contrived disagreement on the other hand. Let me first talk briefly about the legitimate disagreement. And the legitimate disagreement, uh, let's give an illustration of what it looks like in practice rather than looking at it in theory. Let's take the question of those Palestinian refugees. You can agree on the facts of what happened in 1948. You can have factual disagreement, but you can have moral disagreement. The moral judgment doesn't follow from the factual one. Well, what does that mean? Let's take someone like Benny Morris. He acknowledges what happened in 1948 was an ethnic cleansing. He doesn't dispute it. But he says, I think sometimes ethnic cleansings are good things, not bad things. So he says in North America, I'm using his words now, I think the annihilation, his word, of the native population was a good thing because it made possible the great American republic. And the same way he says, I think the expulsion, the cleansing of the Palestinians was a good thing because it made possible a Jewish state. And he's very emphatic, in my view rightfully so, that it was impossible to create a Jewish state without ethnic cleansing. He says, however way you cut up that map of Palestine, however way you try to cut it up, you still have the problem that there are too many Arabs. And he points rightfully, for example, to the case of the famous 1930s uh, proposal in 37 of the Peel Commission, which says we'll give the Pals we'll give the Israelis not Israelis then we'll give the Jews 10 percent of Palestine. But even with 10 percent, you still have to expel 250,000 Palestinian Arabs, says the Peel Commission. However, way you cut it up you couldn't get a predominantly Jewish state. And so Morris is very straightforward. If that was the price to create a Jewish state, I think a Jewish state is the greater good. Or if you take, for example, Harvard professor Alan Dershowitz in his 1991 quote-unquote autobiography, you always have to qualify it, uh, he writes that uh, ethnic cleansing is a, uh, let's get it right, a fifth-rate moral issue. And he says it's akin to massive urban renewal. And it's not an important, it's an issue, but relatively speaking, a trivial one. Um, that's a moral judgment. People disagree in their moral judgments, even if they agree with the facts. Now, if you return for a moment to the uh, moral universe of normal human beings, you can, agree, you can agree on the facts, you can agree on the moral issues, you can agree on the legal issues, but still reach altogether different political conclusions. Now, that may surprise some of you. How does that work? Let's take Professor Chomsky. He agrees it was an ethnic cleansing in 1948. Nobody disputes that, or virtually no one. He agrees morally it was an abomination. Legally, Palestinians have the right to return. Incidentally, it will come as a surprise to people here, I think, that right of return, it's utterly uncontroversial among uh, legal specialists. It's not a contentious issue. In the year 2000, Amnesty International put out a statement. Human Rights Watch put out a statement. They said the Palestinian right to return is incontrovertible. There is no way that under international law you can deny them that right. 
I know personally that within Human Rights Watch, some members lobbied very hard to get Human Rights Watch not to reach that conclusion. They even hired outside lawyers to prove the Palestinians did not have the right of return. But when Human Rights Watch, in good faith, examined the law, the conclusion was inexorable. Twist and turn the words as much as you like, but no honest person in good faith can reach another conclusion. So Professor Chomsky, well within the mainstream consensus among legal scholars, says under international law they have the right of return. However, he reaches an altogether different political conclusion. He says, I don't think it's feasible, I don't think it's going to happen, and I think it's immoral to tell Palestinians in refugee camps to give them hope that it will happen when it's not going to happen. That's a different political conclusion. Agree in the facts, the morality, the legality, but the politics, a different conclusion. To my thinking, that doesn't make anyone the enemy. Honest people can disagree. It's called judgment. And matters of judgment, people weigh things, weigh factors, and reach different conclusions. Uh, doesn't make anyone the enemy. Those are, in my view, legitimate disagreements. Having said that, I also have an obligation to point out that on the broader question of the politics of the Israel-Palestine conflict, again, there is no controversy at all. Since the late, since the mid-1970s, the international community has reached a consensus on how to resolve the conflict. Everyone in this room knows it. It's called the two-state consensus. Israel has to fully withdraw from the West Bank and Gaza and East Jerusalem in accordance with that principle I mentioned earlier, the inadmissibility of acquiring territory by war, and the Palestinians in a, in a, uh, once in a state, as well as neighboring Arab states, have to recognize Israel's right as a state to live at peace with its neighbors in, its, in the region. That's the two-state settlement. Everyone's familiar with it. It's also not controversial. If you look at, we'll take two examples. In 1989, the United Nations General Assembly votes on the two-state settlement. The vote is 151 to 3. No abstentions. The whole world in one camp, Israel, the United States, and the island state of Dominica in the other camp. That's it. 151 to 3, no, uh, no abstentions. Now, let's fast forward to 2003, 2004, two, well, we haven't gotten the votes yet in 2005. 2001, 2, 3, and 4. In that period, there have been genuinely world historic changes uh, uh, in, our, uh, in the world in which we live. Uh, First of all, a whole social system disappeared. The Soviet system disappeared in that period. So there were quite significant political changes. And then there were profound geographic changes. Between 1989 and today, 40 new states joined the United Nations, 40 new nation states. Uh, as the Soviet bloc decomposed, uh, 40 new states joined the UN. But what's most striking is, to my thinking, notwithstanding the real uh, geopolitical changes in the world, the two-state consensus remains as solid as it was before. So if you look at the vote for 2001, 2002, 2003, 2004, it's always the same. It's the whole world on one side, and then there are seven dissents at most, and they're always the same. The United States, Israel, Nauru, Palo, Tuvalu, Micronesia, and the Marshall Islands. That's it. That's it. 
You can check it on the web. They have the vote every year. Now, for those of you who don't know Nauru, Halu, and Tuvalu, this is a Yale audience, so I suspect if I ask, there should be more than the usual number who know it. How many know Naru, Palu, Tuvalu? All right, it's not a great showing, but okay, it's, a, it's five. It's usually three, so okay, you're first here. Um, uh, there are South Pacific eight holes, Naru, it's uh, main export, the fancy name is guanu, the less fancy name is bird droppings. Uh, <laughs> Tuvalu is disappearing because of global warming, uh, so we don't have to worry about that too much. <laughs> and, and, and their total populations could probably fit in empty seats in this room. And that's it. <laughs> that's it. Uh, those are so even on the question of the political dimension of the conflict, leaving aside the thorny issue of the Palestinian refugees, and I recognize that as not being an easy question to resolve, but leaving that aside, there is a consensus on resolving the conflict as well, apart from the United States, Israel, and the South Pacific atolls. And that brings us again to that initial question. If there's agreement on the history, agreement on the human rights, close, uh, a broad consensus on the political dimension, how do you explain all the conflict? I should say the passionate disagreement, the <coughs> vehement disagreement, the contention on the topic. And the argument I would make is that there are basically three kinds of illegitimate fraudulent, <coughs> contrived disagreement on the Israel-Palestine conflict. The first kind is, in no special order of importance, the first kind is the attempt to mystify the conflict, the claim that the Israel-Palestine conflict is so profound, so deep, so impenetrable, that you have to have a knowledge the equivalent of rocket science to understand it. We're told sometimes it's about a cosmic clash of civilizations, a cosmic clash of religions. It goes back to biblical hatreds and enmities. But this is a very complicated conflict. And accordingly, you have to suspend your normal moral judgments because in this conflict, those instinctive judgments of yours, like it's wrong to blow up houses, or it's wrong to torture detainees, or those sorts of thing, things, those normal judgments, moral judgments, they have to be held in suspension because this conflict is different from any other. The fancy term is it's sui generis. You can't compare it. And of course, you shouldn't compare it. Because once you do start comparing it, the wrong comparisons come to mind. Like some of you may begin to compare it with Native Americans in the course of the European conquest of North America. And that's a bad comparison because of who comes out on which side in the comparison. And don't compare it to apartheid. That's another bad comparison. Because, who comes of, because of who comes out on which side in the comparison or in the analogy. So we're told this conflict is so complicated, so profound, so deep, so complex that you shouldn't compare, you can't compare, and don't believe those visceral judgments that you make on the conflict. What's very striking about those formulations is how diametrically, <coughs> diametrically at odds they are with all the scholarship and documentation on the topic. I'll give you an example. Most of you know, I assume, that for a broad period from after World War I, the Palestine was under a British mandate. And during that mandate period, there were lots of conflicts, riots, rebellions, revolts, and so forth by the indigenous population. And every time there was one of these outbreaks of violence, 
the British sent over a parliamentary investigative uh, team group to find out what's going on. And they produced these reports in 1920, 21, 29, 36. The truth is the reports, exba exactly what you would expect from the British, they're of very high quality. They're excellent. No, it's true. Remember, you know, when Marx wants to document the conditions of the British working class, he uses the British blue books. The quality is very high. This is not Judy Miller. This is serious. <laughs> uh, and uh, they are well worth reading today. If you look at the most well-known, the Peel Commission uh, report on Palestine, What's most striking when you read it is, in the historical sections, the word that keeps reappearing is obvious, obviously, obvious, obvious. Why are the Arabs of Palestine, as they call them, why are the Arabs of Palestine rebelling? They said, it's not complicated, it's obvious. All of the neighboring Arab states are getting independent, have gotten independence or are on their way to independence, namely Transjordan, the only ones who are being denied their right to self-determination and statehood are the Arabs of Palestine. So they say it's obvious why they're rebelling. And then they say, well, all of these Jews are pouring in, and the Arabs of Palestine are worried that when they're finally given the independence, they'll be a minority, and they don't know what's going to happen to them as a minority. And the British said, so it's obvious why there are revolts and so forth in Palestine. Not complicated, not complicated at all. The political solution, they said, yes, that's complicated. But the roots of the conflict, very straightforward, and they keep reiterating it. Or let's take the case of Benny Morris, He's written what's now the standard history of the Israel-Palestine conflict, probably used in most classes at uh, Yale, the book Righteous Victims. And at some point in his book, early on in his book, he has to explain the conflict in British Mandate Palestine. And he says, the fear of territorial dispossession and displacement was to be the chief motor of Arab antagonism to Zionism. The fear of territorial displacement and dispossession was to be the chief motor of Arab antagonism to Zionism. Now, some of you are wondering, well, what's so profound about that, and why did he read it twice? The truth is, when I read those words, they, metaphorically speaking, practically leapt off the page for me. Why? Because notice what he doesn't say. He doesn't say the chief motor of Arab antagonism to Zionism is anti-Semitism. He doesn't say it's hatred of Jews. He doesn't say it's fear of the Enlightenment. <laughs> he doesn't say it's fear of the emancipation of women. He sees the reality. It's pretty straightforward. They're rebelling because they're afraid they're going to lose their country. And the odd thing is, were you to look at any other comparable, kindred conflict, the sorts of explanations which are contrived in the case of the Israel-Palestine conflict would be laughable. Let's take North America. Now, Nobody should be so politically correct as to forget the Native American resistance to Euro-American encroachment was very bloody. It was murderous. The Native Americans killed men. They killed women. They killed children. The cowboy Indian movies weren't entirely wrong. It was an ugly picture. Not to say that the Euro-Americans didn't do the same thing, even if you read Teddy Roosevelt, who's the great historian of the American West, uh, he will acknowledge, he says, sometimes those settlers sunk to the level of those savages. Uh, so it was ugly on both sides, and it was more than sometimes. But 
what would anyone think, what would any rational person think if a historian were to write today that the Native Americans were rebelling because of anti-Europeanism <laughs> or anti-whiteism or anti-Christianism. You don't need these exotic explanations. Maybe doctoral candidates in search of a topic need one, but most normal human beings don't need these exotic explanations. The obvious explanation, namely the fear of territorial dispossession and displacement, the obvious explanation also happens to be a sufficient explanation for what happened and what continues to happen day by day as the last parcels of their homeland are being swallowed up. The other kind of contrived, illegitimate, false uh, controversy is the attempt to constantly drag in issues which have nothing whatever to do with the Israel-Palestine conflict. Most famously, or infamously, the exploitation of the Nazi Holocaust, the dragging in of the Nazi Holocaust whenever the Israel-Palestine conflict comes up. I don't have time now to go into that topic. It really requires some time. I will just make as a brief remark uh, the fact that the main contribution of the Holocaust industry was to conjure up this notion of the uniqueness of Jewish suffering. The purpose being that if Jews suffered uniquely during the Nazi Holocaust, then they're entitled to special moral dispensations. You can't hold them to the same standards because their suffering was so much more, so much more egregious than anyone else's. So if Israelis blow up homes, but what about the Holocaust? And if Israelis torture systematically, methodically, routinely Palestinian detainees, what about the Holocaust? And so the Holocaust was used as a means of extenuating the moral standards as they, came, as they should have been applied to Israel. The most recent version of this exploitation of suffering for crass political ends is, of course, what's called the new anti-Semitism, about which I suspect everybody here has heard something. What's most striking about the new anti-Semitism is, number one, it's not new, and number two, it's not about anti-Semitism. <laughs> what do I mean by that? Let's start with the question of its vintage. Roughly every 15 years, American Jewish organizations conjure up the claim of a new anti-Semitism. If you go back to 1974, the head of the ADL, the Anti-Defamation League, uh, it's the main Jewish defense organization, the ADL, it specializes in defaming the character of anyone who criticizes Israel. The ADL put out in 1974, the head, uh, Arnold Foster and his colleague Benjamin Epstein, they put out a book, you should go check your library. My DePaul University Library has about six books, and we amazingly have it, so you've got to have it. What was it called? It was called The New Anti-Semitism. In 1981, the new head of the ADL is a fellow named Nathan Perlmutter, and he and his wife, Ruth Ann Perlmutter, they put out a book. It's called The Real Anti-Semitism, the thesis of which is there's a new anti-Semitism. And in 2000 or 2001, the current head of the ADL, uh, Abraham Foxman, puts out a new book, Never Again, about the new anti-Semitism. Every time Israel comes under uh, international pressure to settle the conflict or suffers a public relations debacle, as it did in the Second Intifada, they drum up this claim of a new anti-Semitism. What's really striking, to me at any rate, is not only at the general level, but at the level of the detail 
it's a case of everything old is new again. You open up the Arnold Foster Benjamin Epstein book, and one of the centerpieces of their evidence of a new anti-Semitism is this new Broadway, sh excuse me, this new film that came out based on the Broadway show. The film and the Broadway show were called Jesus Christ Superstar. And Epstein and Foster maintain it's replete with anti-Semitism. It's a very strange story. The fellow who directed it was a guy named, and still is, uh, Norman Jewison. And Norman Jewison, who's not Jewish, he just wrote his autobiography, which I happened to pick up in the bookstore out of curiosity. And he mentions in pages like 11 to 12, he says, I always wanted to be Jewish. That was my thing. I always wanted to be a Jew. I grow up, I get to know Golda Meir. We're friends. And then once you know it, I get to direct the cinematic version of the great Broadway show, Fiddler on the Roof. Some of you know it. If I were a rich man. Okay, something like that. Okay, and Fiddler on the Roof is a tremendous hit as a Broadway show and also as his film. He's very proud. Jews love him. And then somebody comes along and says, do you want to do Jesus Christ Superstar, which also had been a Broadway show. He says, great. And he does Jesus Christ Superstar. And he says, I don't know what happened. Now everyone's calling me an anti-Semite. I don't know what I did. And they were calling this other guy who did this score, Andrew Lloyd Webber. He was an anti-Semite also. Now, some of you don't know anti Andrew Lloyd Webber. He went on to produce that other great uh, Broadway and, uh, and display of anti-Semitism, that extravaganza, Cats. You know, some people said it was a coded reference to the Cats family. Uh, <laughs> and what was... What was really striking, and then Norman Jewish inventions, and this is what I felt redeemed about, because the first chapter of my book is called From Jesus Christ Superstar to Passion of the Christ. And he mentions the same thing that happened to me, this weird thing. The same thing happened to Mel Gibson's Passion of the Christ. And that was quite revealing, because it had nothing to do with the content of the film, they were just exploited to whip up a hysteria about a new anti-Semitism. There isn't a scratch, not a jot, of evidence of a new anti-Semitism, either here or in Europe. Let's take the case of the U.S. briefly. As most of you perhaps know, they claim that they, the uh, university campuses, campus life, it's rife with anti-Semitism. Now, on its face, that proposition is ridiculous. Why? For better or for worse, and I've been taught at many colleges, mostly for worse, um, colleges are so politically correct. You can't be anti-anything on an American <laughs> college campus nowadays. You can't be anti-black, you can't be anti-Jewish, you can't be anti-Puerto Rican, you can't be anti-tall, anti-short, anti-fat, anti-skinny, anti-ugly. You can't be it. So the idea that amid all of this sometimes oppressive political correctness, there are pogroms unfolding against Jews, as we're told, is on its face loony. In fact, when you start looking at the evidence, and for the book, I did start doing it. Take the example which is close to home for you. How many of you know the progressive, as it's called, Jewish magazine Tikkun? Raise your hand. Good. So Tikkun has a big front page uh, cover story called The New Anti-Semitism, written by a woman, Marilyn Greenspan. And she begins the article by talking about how an Orthodox Jew at Yale was assaulted in his dormitory. Okay, I found that interesting. So the first thing I did was, I called up the Yale Center for Jewish Life, the campus Hillel. Do you know about the incident? Never heard of it. Okay, I then called up the Yale administration. Have you heard about the incident? Never heard of it. <laughs> 
So nice, you know, I wrote Marilyn Greenspan. What's your basis for that claim about Yale? She said, uh, she wrote back, she didn't answer me. I wrote again, she didn't answer, and then I wrote uh, Rabbi Lerner, who's the editor and I uh, guess publisher of Tikkun, and I said to him, uh, I think she's obliged to give me a response. And he felt that was correct, and he wrote her and asked her, tell her you have to answer him. And she said, her reply was, I heard it on Pat Robertson's 700 Club. <laughs> Now, remember, 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 that's a progressive Jewish magazine. And I went through cases, one at University of Chicago, one at Michigan. They all turned out to be false. Now, some of you may say, well, your sample may be skewed. Fair enough. There are so many calls I can make on this. Let's take the case which was put under a microscope. Let's take the case at Columbia University. Most of you have heard about that. Create a huge hysteria. Newspaper editorials were calling for professors to be fired. Politicians weighed in. They've got to go. Nat Henthoff, the so-called civil libertarian, he said, what's going on at Columbia is, you know, anti-Semitism, rampant, rife. Okay. President of Columbia, Lee Bollinger, comes under pressure, has to create an ad hoc committee. The ad hoc committee cannot be accused of being anti-Israel. The ad hoc committee, the special representative on the committee was Floyd Abrams, who apart from being the leading uh, authority in the First Amendment in the United States, he also was one of the chief endorsers of Alan Dershowitz's The Case for Israel, which I'll get to presently. <laughs> and. The committee takes witnesses, examines the cases, looks at the evidence. It produces a report. What did the report find? Here we have the test case placed under a microscope. All the media are looking at it. No chance here of escaping. You can run, but you can't hide. What did they find? They found that in one case, in one class, on one day, a professor responded heatedly to a student who was trying to justify Israeli depredations in Jenin in April 2002. That's it. That is it. A professor responded heatedly to a student who was trying to defend Israeli actions in Jenin. That was it. But that wasn't all they found. That's what they found on the issue of anti-Semitism. They also found that pro-Israeli students on campus and organizations were bringing in people from the neighborhood and pretending to be auditors and heckling and causing disruption in the classes <coughs> of the Arab professors. They also found that one student was secretly videotaping an Arab professor giving his lecture. They also found that one pro-Israel professor in the medical school was instructing students to go into the classes of the Arab professors and report back on what they had heard. And Columbia, in its report, which was quite kind of ironic, what was supposed to be a report investigating the new anti-Semitism at Columbia, it actually reserved its most harsh language for those supporters of Israel who they said were, quote, threatening to turn students into informers. That was the conclusion in the most exhaustively documented case we have of this anti-Semitism, which is rampant on college campuses. I don't have time now to go into the European case, except to say, again, a very abbreviated presentation. In the case of Europe, let's just take one example. The most reputable of the public, uh, of the public polling organizations is considered to be the Pew Charitable Trusts. I'm sure everybody has heard of them in some context or another. 
Well, in 2003, Pew was doing a survey of European opinion towards the United States one year after the, Gulf, the last invasion of Iraq. And because of the issue, the issue of anti-Semitism had come up, they decided to look into that question. And what the Pew Charitable Trust found was not only was there no evidence of a new anti-Semitism in Europe, they found that as compared to the last time they did the survey, as compared to the last time, actually, the last time was 1991, there was now less anti-Semitism in Europe than ever before. The whole claim of a new anti-Semitism, whether here or in Europe, is pure fraud. There's just no evidence for it. I don't have time to go through the whole record now, uh, but I do in the book. I go through all the reports that were published to look at the evidence. The evidence is laughable. Anti-Semitism in Italy. Well, how do you know? We attended a meeting of the newly formed Communist Party, and there were people wearing kafias. That was the evidence they used. New evidence of anti-Semitism in Netherlands. What's the evidence? During the Israeli invasion of Jenin, Greta Deusenberg, the wife of the president of the U uh, European Bank, Greta Deusenberg uh, hoisted the Palestinian flag on her balcony. That's what the new anti-Semitism is about. It's just about criticism of Israel and criticism of what Israel is doing to the Palestinians. And that's credited as anti-Semitism. Let me now turn to the fast, the, excuse me, the last uh, topic of contrived and illegitimate disagreement. And in many ways, in many ways, it's kind of the funniest one, but also the most depressing one. And that is the vast proliferation, the vast proliferation of sheer fraud masquerading as scholarship on the Israel-Palestine conflict. I began my t remarks this evening by recalling my own experience with the uh, Joan Peters hoax uh, in 1984. And I end my remarks by another hoax which illustrates uh, the, the persistence of this problem. Now, it is true that there's a vast proliferation of fraud and nonsense in general in uh, public life. Probably around 60% or more of what you find on the web is loony, and uh, we all know that. It's crazy. So the fact that somebody produces a hoax or individuals produce a hoax is not really news. What is news and what makes the Israel-Palestine conflict in many ways unusual, I refuse to use the word unique, uh, make it unusual, is how much that is sheer nonsense and fakery passes muster as serious scholarship. That's a peculiarity of this conflict. Every academic discipline has what you can call mechanisms of quality control. And in the natural sciences, they're obviously much more uh, compelling and uh, determinative than in the social so studies, because laboratories can repeat, replicate experiments and see whether what somebody says is true. In the social studies, we have methods of quality control which are um, uh, not as efficient, uh, but they most of the time work. So how do they work? Uh, let's take an example. Remind me of your name? Excuse me? Fakery. Yeah, Fakery. Okay. Fakery comes up to me and he says, Professor Finkelstein, you won't believe what I just read. All right. What did you read? I read that Israel's human rights record in the occupied territories is generally superb. Really? Generally superb? And now the skeptical academic squints his eyes and puts to work those 
mechanisms of quality control. So Finkelstein says to Fakhry, really, who published that book? <laughs> Fakhry says, it was published by John Wiley and Sons. And Finkelstein thinks, well, that is a reputable publisher. He's passed through, through that hoop. But then the skeptical academic says to Fakhry, who blurbed that book? And Fakhry says, who blurbed that book? This book got excellent blurbs. There is a blurb from Henry Louis Gates at Harvard. There is a blurb from Floyd Abrams, the New York Times' uh, attorney. Excellent blurbs. Really? Al Finkelstein is wondering what's going on here. And he turns to that third mechanism of quality control. He says, Fakhry, what kind of reviews did that book get? And Fakhri says, reviews? <laughs> this book got great reviews. The New York Times Sunday Book Review gave this book a laudatory review, and it wasn't written by just anyone. This, book, this review was written by the Times' resident expert on the Israel-Palestine conflict a fellow named Ethan Brunner. He's the one who writes all the editorials in the Times on the Israel-Palestine conflict. Really? Sunday Times book review, Ethan Brunner. So now the skeptical academic, he pulls that last card out. Fakhry, who is this professor? And Fakhry responds now he knows the argument is clinched. He says, who is he? He is the senior most professor at Harvard Law School. His name is Alan Dershowitz. And it's true. You can pass through every one of the mechanisms of quality control when it comes to the Israel-Palestine conflict, and yet your book can be sheer nonsense from start to finish. Sheer fraud from start to finish. We don't know where start begins. Some people think it's the first word of the first page in the book. Others think it's the first name of the author appended to the book. But wherever the fraud begins, it's sheer fraud. It's not only sheer fraud, but in large part, it plagiarizes another fraud. Dershowitz plagiarizes Joan Peters's From Time Immemorial. Now, the truth be told, I found that kind of funny. I really did. I was sitting down in my bed with both books, comparing the text, and I thought, this is kind of funny. The Felix Frankfurter professor at Harvard Law School, he not only plagiarizes, which is, you know, the big taboo in academia, and academia can say anything as long as it's footnoted, but you can't, you know, the world is flat, footnote, flat earth society. <laughs> You're allowed to do it. But you can't, you can't plagiarize. Plagiarize is the big taboo. He not only plagiarizes, he plagiarizes a hoax. Now that's funny. You have to admit it. It's funny. I laugh. But then you start going through the book, as I did, exactly as I did with the Joan Peters, go through it footnote by footnote, and as I state in the book, and the book passed through, as I'll get to in a moment, five libel lawyers, every meaningful statement in the book is a lie. It's just made up. It's flat-out fakery. The core of the book is on Israel's human rights record. And, as I said earlier, his claim is Israel's human rights record is generally superb. Well, there is no way reading the mainstream human rights organizations on which, as I said, there's a consensus when it comes to Israel and Palestine, you could reach that conclusion. 
And Professor Dershowitz is perfectly aware of that fact. He knows you can't reach that conclusion. How do I know he knows? The most striking thing about the book, how many of you have read it? Raise your hand if I don't mind. OK. The most striking thing about the book, just a few. The most striking thing about the book is he never once, he never once cites any mainstream human rights organization, Amnesty International, Human Rights Watch, Beth Selim, Public Committee Against Torture in Israel, Physicians for Human Rights in Israel, never once cites any of them in order to support his claims. He doesn't cite them, not because he doesn't want to. Anyone who wants credibility will, of course, cite the mainstream human rights organizations. He doesn't cite them, not because he doesn't want to, but because he can't. There is no way you can cite these human rights organizations and reach a conclusion that his Israel's human rights record is generally superb. The only possible conclusion you can reach citing, those, uh, doc citing that documentation is that their human rights record is generally abysmal, in many ways unique. The only country in the world which legalized torture. The only country in the world which legalized hostage taking, or as Chief Justice Barak liked to call it at the time, using bargaining chips. The only country in the world, apart from Saddam for a brief period, the only country in the world which used house demolitions as a legal form of punishment. In many ways, Israel's human rights record was unique, egregiously unique. There was no way reading the reports, you could reach the conclusion it was generally superb. And so what Dershowitz did was mangled findings, used Israeli foreign affairs website claims, Palestinian suicide bombers are spreading AIDS deliberately, Palestinian female suicide bombers had been purposely raped by Fatah to force them to commit their suicide bombings, uh, all that sort of stuff, sheer nonsense, just made up, just made up. And that's what's kind of astonishing, that you can do that on this conflict and, in fact, not only get away with it, not only get praised for it, but you never get called on it. So I mentioned to you at the beginning of my remarks the challenge with the Joan Peters book was not documenting the fraud because it was so crude and so gross. It took a few months. The challenge was publicizing the findings. And the same thing, exactly the same thing, has happened with Dershowitz's book. At the beginning, it was Dershowitz, Professor Dershowitz's initiative. So... First, he sent letters, multi-page letters, single-spaced letters, six pages, six pages, six pages, different letters, to my first publisher, putting them, quote, on notice uh, if they published my book. The first publisher didn't withdraw the book. I'm not going to go into the details now unless you're interested. I then switched to the University of California Press. Professor Dershowitz then starred with the letters again. When the letters didn't cause the University of California press to back down, he then hired the most power, what's reputed to be the most powerful law firm in the country, Kravath, Swain, and Moore, to block publication of the book. That didn't succeed. The publisher stood firm. He then went to... Uh, the Terminator, he went to the governor of California, Arnold Schwarzenegger, <laughs> uh, because uh, the University of California Press is uh, under, the, under the Board of Regents, the aegis of the Board of Regents, and the governor is an ex officio member of the Board of Regents. He went to Governor Schwarzenegger to block publication of the book. Uh, and uh, to Governor Schwarzenegger's credit, uh, he said he would refuse to intervene 
uh, because it's a question of academic freedom. Whether he knew what academic freedom meant, I don't know. But, you know he still came out <clears throat> on the right side, and the book wasn't terminated. Um, and the, the book was published. Um, the book had a huge amount of pre-publication publicity. It was uh, several stories in Publishers Weekly, which is the trade magazine of the publishing in industry. It was a cover story of the Chronicle of Higher Education, a major story in the LA Times and the Nation magazine. And usually when you get pre-publication publicity like that, reviewers are climbing over each other's back to get the first book copy to review. But in fact, and I was totally unsurprised, the book has not been reviewed at all. Because it's the cause. And you have to understand, when it comes to the cause, altogether different rules apply. Then it's party discipline. It's the cause. Most people understand the party discipline. You pretend the book never happened. Um, so uh, New York Times, uh, a few months ago, it ran a big story on plagiarism at Harvard because Lawrence Tribe, the liberal lawyer, was accused rightfully, as it turns out, of plagiarism. Charles Ogletree, another member of the faculty, was accused of plagiarism. There was a third case, Alan Dershowitz. But Alan Dershowitz was not mentioned in the story. It's very striking because the Times likes Tribe. He's a good liberal, comes out right on the abortion issue, on civil liberties, and so forth. They like Tribe. They like Ogletree. He was one of the defenders way back when of Anita Hill, for those of you who go back that far. They like Ogletree. But they felt an obligation. There, was a claim, there were stories about plagiarism. They had to finally report it. But not Dershowitz. Dershowitz is the cause. And therefore, he is not mentioned in the article. Reviews, you would think the Times would have an obligation since it praised Dershowitz's book, don't they have an obligation to review a book which says his is a fraud? Now, some of you are thinking, well, why should they believe you? Who are you? Third-rate professor from a third-rate university. Or as, professors, uh, as Dershowitz says, a transient academic of, uh, and a nobody. Okay, fair enough, and I'm not going to even argue it. But wait, I played according to the rules. The book came out from a, not a left-wing loony press. It came out from a mainstream academic press. It didn't have two outside experts who are called peer reviews check the manuscript. It had seven. It had the chair of the Department of Sociology at the Hebrew University, Baruch Kimmerling. It had a university chair at Oxford. It had a senior researcher at Harvard. It had a chair at MIT. And it had a chair in Judaic studies at Berkeley, a Rabbi Daniel Boyarin. And they all said the book is excellent. The book was then vetted by five libel lawyers. Not one, not two, not three, not four, not five libel lawyers who drove me out of my mind for about six months. It passed through all the mechanisms of quality control but it reached the wrong conclusion. It didn't reach the wrong conclusion only about Dershowitz. It reached the wrong conclusion about the Times, about the reviewer who's also their resident expert who writes all their editorials and who's transparently an imbecile. Uh, it reached the wrong conclusion about him. And frankly, that's where I want to leave off. Uh, many people are trying to dismiss my findings as being a kind of sandbox fight with Alan Dershowitz. It's degenerate into a petty feud with a lot of ugly name calling between Professor Dershowitz and myself. And now I'm going to say something which I think people will be surprised at and they won't believe it. I can only say I'm trying to be as honest as I can. I personally, and I mean this, I rather feel sorry for Professor Dershowitz. I really do. He grew up in Borough Park in Brooklyn, 
around eight blocks from where I lived. He was in 48th Street in Borough Park. I was in 40th Street. It's a very modest neighborhood. His happened to be an Orthodox Jewish home. Mine was not. But I know uh, his achievements are real. He went to the yeshiva of Flatbush and then to a relatively modest college, not a bad school, but not an Ivy League school. He went to Brooklyn College. And from Brooklyn College, he went to Yale Law School, and he graduated first in his class. Now, that is an achievement. And I would be the last one to gainsay it, because I know what it means to come from that background and achieve that. And then he became the youngest tenured professor at Harvard Law School. And that's an achievement. It's a great achievement. But the problem is that at some point when you reach that stature, you realize that you can say anything. You can say anything, and you are untouchable. Number one, because people refuse to believe a professor at Harvard Law School of his stature can be flat out lying. It's like that, you know, that old expression, it's cognitive dissonance. It can't be. He must be saying something, there's some truth to it. And he realizes, I can say anything, and people will believe it. And then he starts saying anything. You know, that kind of power corrupts. But I do not blame him. I think a lot of what he's done is vicious, but I don't blame him. What I blame is the institutions who are supposed to hold you accountable. But when it comes to power, and when it comes to power conjoined to the cause, there is no accountability. Professor Dershowitz has now been given to saying that, quote, I'm quoting from his Harvard Law School, the Harvard Law School webpage, that Finkelstein suspects his late mother was a Nazi collaborator. That's what he writes. Now, my late mother from 1939 to 1943 was in the Warsaw Ghetto. In 1943, in April, when the ghetto was put down, the uprising was put down, she was in Maidana concentration camp. And then she was in two slave labor camps. Every single member of her family was exterminated. As is with my father, the only difference being he was in Auschwitz concentration camp and, the, and then the Auschwitz death march. Now, there is nothing, and I'm trying to be objective, there is nothing more humanly despicable in the face of the suffering she endured and after her death to go around saying, as he says in his Harvard webpage, as he says in his new book, The Case for Peace, the Case for Peace as he says everywhere, that Finkelstein suspects his late mother was a Nazi collaborator and a capo. Well, I think everyone in this room would agree that's like really over the top. So I have an email correspondence with the dean of Harvard Law School, Elena Kagan. I said, you know, Ms. Kagan, I have two questions for you. Number one, this is what I wrote about my late mother. This is what Dershowitz says. Is there any way you can render what I said as being my late mother was a Nazi collaborator? She won't answer that. Okay, let's go to question two. Uh, Dean Kagan, do you have any limits? Any limits on what you allow professors to put on Harvard Law School's webpage? Her press person, Michael Armini, replies, we give professors broad limits. Okay, I say, but broad limits, that doesn't mean no limits. So I said, Dean Kagan, let's take a hypothetical. If a Harvard Law professor put up on the webpage, your webpage, that Dean Kagan suspects her mother was a whore, would you have him take it down? <laughs> so she says, I won't discuss this anymore. <laughs> and you know what's funny about that? I don't think that comment even remotely approaches what Dershowitz says. But why does he do it? Why does he do it? He does it for two reasons. Number one, 
It's the Hitlerian big lie technique. And I don't mean that pejoratively. I do not, because Hitler had a good insight. He says with lying, lying is counterintuitive. You would assume smaller lies are more credible than bigger lies. But he says it's not true. When somebody utters a small lie, you think maybe that's true, maybe that's not. But when somebody utters a gargantuan lie, you think nobody could possibly be so brazen as to say something like that unless it's true. And so the credibility of lies is inversely proportional to their size. And Dershowitz understands that. Say something so brazenly, egregiously false. Finkelstein thinks his late mother was a Nazi collaborator. And even people in this audience, I'm certain, I'm certain are thinking, there must be some truth to it. He couldn't possibly have said that. A Harvard Law professor saying something so scandalous? It can't be. So part of it is the psychology, which is intelligent enough, and part of it is what I said earlier, zero accountability. He knows he can say anything, and he can get away with it. And that's, in my opinion, it's not his fault. It's the institutions which took what was obviously a quite you know, impressive young man of tremendous attainments and turned him into a moral monster. It's the institutions that created him, and it's the institutions which, in my view, are responsible for the lies and also for the perpetuation of a conflict which, frankly, could be resolved very easily, intelligently, and happily for all parties concerned. Thank you.